thanks everybody for joining this uh, call. Uh, well, we live in very interesting times and the last few days have been far too interesting. Um, I think for, I think, I assume I speak for everybody on this call when, uh, when I say we could all use a little bit of calm and sanity uh, and less anger and anxiety and division. Um, but here we are and uh, I um, would expect um, that uh, our country is, is likely to experience a lot of crisis over the next few months as we approach November. And a lot of what we're experiencing in the last week, um, I think is very much about um, the, uh, the, the, the politics of, of 2020 and the way some people are trying um, to set themselves up. Um, the, despite everything that we are seeing on our television screens and on our social media, I, I would start by making the point that there is overwhelming consensus among the American people on most of the big issues that are facing our country. Um, for the last several months, we have been together as a people in fighting a common enemy, the coronavirus. Probably the most inspiring and extensive collective human American action against a common enemy since the Second World War. Um, the overwhelming majority of Americans, Democrats, Republicans, Independents, North, South, East, West, Old, Young, across every possible division, agrees and has agreed that we need to put public health first above all other things. And we have cooperated with orders and advice from our public health experts to practice social distancing. Most Americans were doing those things before any governor, whether Phil Murphy in our state or anywhere else told us that we have to do it. Um, that is a sign of um, unity uh, based on a sense of common responsibility to one another. We were willing to, to accept deep, deep personal sacrifices to help other people in our community. Um, right now, in the midst of this crisis that has followed the murder of George Floyd by a police officer in Minnesota, once again, the overwhelming majority of the American people, I think, are in the same place. We, we, we believe that what happened to um, Mr. Floyd was profoundly wrong, that the officers responsible should absolutely be held accountable under the law that people have a right to peacefully protest what happened. In fact, they are right to do so. And that at the same time, it is wrong and counterproductive for anybody to use violence, to destroy anything, to hurt anybody in pursuit of those just ends or to take advantage of the anger and anxiety over Mr. Floyd's killing to promote um, other agendas. That's 80, 90% of the American people right there. So why are we in this mess? Why do we feel all this anxiety? Well, I think there are unfortunately forces in our country that want us to be divided, that want us to be angry, that want to pit us against each other, pitting black against white American, pitting um, civilians against the police, setting the military against the civilian population has happened in Washington DC over the last few days, creating chaos on purpose, seeing fire burning and purposefully pouring gasoline on that fire instead of water to put it out. And for most of our modern history, our leaders have tried to douse fires, whether they were Republicans or Democrats, that is not happening right now, which means that it falls to all of the rest of us. And that's what I've been trying to do. As you know, I've been working really, really hard to try to make sure that we get bipartisan action in Congress to help 
um, New Jersey and to help our country deal with the coronavirus epidemic, that we have the help for our public health system that we need and that we have the economic help that we need to be able to survive the lockdowns. And we've made tremendous progress there after a lot of um, fits and starts and, and, um, uh, and, and issues with, with the relief uh, effort at the beginning. Uh, the PPP program is now running much, much um, better. Um, we're having more and more folks get the unemployment checks that, uh, that they deserve. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, last week actually, we passed in the House almost unanimously legislation to extend and fix the small business relief program. That bill passed the Senate last night. It's gone to President Trump. It'll be, become law. Um, so we're, we're doing a lot and it's having a lot of impact, positive impact on people's lives. Um, and meanwhile, I'm trying to find, um, the, what I think is, um, the overwhelmingly American middle ground, um, when it comes to dealing, uh, with issues of racism in our society, um, respect for law, um, respect for justice and maintaining the all important lines between civilian and military authority uh, in how we respond to public unrest uh, in, in our country. So that's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot going on right now and I'm in the thick of, uh, of just about all of it. So um, I would be very, very grateful to uh, hear from you all your thoughts about uh, what's happening, what you think I should be doing uh, and to take uh, any questions that you might have uh, about, well, anything. So uh, with that, I will turn it back over to DeAndre to uh, moderate the discussion uh, and look forward to uh, an interesting hour. Thank you, Tom. Um, once again, for everyone on the call, we're gonna hit a few frequently asked questions that were pre-submitted, um, and then you are welcome to start chatting in or messaging us any questions that you would like to ask the Congressman live. Um, please include your name and contact information. Um, that's very important, so if we don't get any, uh, to your question on the call, or if there's additional follow-up after the call, um, a staff member can follow up with you. Tom, your first question, what is being done to ensure appropriate oversight over the stimulus spending? Uh, so it's a great question. We need oversight. Uh, we, we have approved over a trillion dollars uh, in spending to help um, relieve the economic suffering that the lockdowns uh, have, uh, have created. Um, and uh, Congress, um, in the legislation that we passed, particularly the CARES Act, uh, established several layers of uh, accountability, um, some of which the administration is resisting, which is why this is an important uh, question. Um, so, uh, you know, the, 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 the main element of resistance that we've seen uh, has come in the form of um, firings of inspectors general at a number uh, of executive branch departments. Um, this is unprecedented in the eight years of the Obama administration. Uh, only one inspector general uh, was removed from office and there are dozens of inspectors general uh, at government uh, departments. Um, this is now becoming an epidemic in, in the, the Trump administration just yesterday. Uh, I spent several hours in a House Foreign Affairs Committee a deposition, a voluntary deposition of um, the uh, State Department uh, Inspector General who was uh, fired uh, without, uh, fired by the president for no stated reason. We believe it was because um, the, the State Department Inspector General was conducting several investigations that were making Secretary of State Pompeo feel uncomfortable. Um, uh, we've seen the demotion of the uh, Inspector General at the Department of Defense, who was supposed to lead uh, a common uh, effort uh, by the collective of Inspectors General to oversee the coronavirus assistance. So that's the problem. Uh, but as I said, we created several layers of oversight. There is 
uh, also a, um, uh, an oversight body appointed by Congress, uh, which is being uh, stood up. That's a bipartisan oversight body. Uh, and in the House of Representatives, uh, we have a select oversight committee that we established, which is holding hearings and investigations now as we, uh, as we speak uh, to make sure that um, the money that we've provided is spent in the right way. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm nervous about this, but I'm also confident that uh, if there is any abuse, it is going to come to light uh, and we will be in a position uh, to do something about it. Thank you, Tom. Um, our next uh, pre-submitted question, um, how can Congress respond to the crisis of racial injustice? I think um, the response begins with listening. Uh, every member of Congress uh, should begin there, uh, should start by hearing out members uh, of their community uh, who uh, have experienced um, uh, in their own lives uh, the, the, the continuing um, disease of racism that um, has always and continues uh, to infect our society, um, who has experienced firsthand uh, the anxiety um, that comes if uh, you are not uh, someone who looks like me and you have an encounter uh, with the, the police. Um, so that's the beginning. And, you know, I've, I've been doing that as much as I can. A couple days ago, uh, I was in Summit, New Jersey uh, for a march that was organized uh, by high school students there. Turned out we... Uh, so I was talking about legislation. Uh, so number one, we need, uh, we need the Justice Department uh, to conduct uh, its oversight responsibilities when uh, local police departments cross a line. That's still rare in America, in my view, but when it happens, there, there needs to be a higher authority that can come in um, and clean things up. We did that, for example, in Ferguson, Missouri, um, when there were severe problems there in 2015. Justice Department uh, used what's known as a consent decree uh, to uh, basically reform the police department, choose new leadership, uh, and make things better. Um, Attorney General Sessions, when he was Attorney General, gutted the ability of the Justice Department to conduct that kind of oversight. We need to make sure um, that it's restored. Um, we need better information. We need better data. So one very simple idea that uh, our Senator Cory Booker has been promoting is a national registry uh, of, um, of incidents, uh, 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 use of force uh, incidents, uh, where state and local police departments would be um, recording uh, and reporting to a national reporting system these incidents so that we actually have data to be able um, to measure uh, the problem. Um, we should, and I think will pass legislation uh, relating to um, the uh, the the uh, distribution of surplus military equipment to police departments around the country. I, I think, you know, some of this is just comes down to um, the, the the feeling that people get when police officers enter their community, how they dress, what they're armed with, what 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 they bring with them. Um, cops should look like cops. They should not look like the 82nd Airborne. Uh, parachuting into Fallujah. That's, that creates precisely the wrong kind of, um, of relationship between police and the communities that they're supposed to serve uh, and protect. And so that's something that we absolutely uh, can address uh, as members of Congress. Um, requiring body cams, very, very simple reform that, that I believe not only protects citizens, but protects police officers, um, the vast majority of whom I think try to do their duty in the right way, and if they are falsely accused uh, of causing harm, a body cam protects the police officer just as it protects a civilian in situations where police officers um, uh, do something uh, that's wrong. So those are some of the things that uh, I think we can look at. I didn't mention the, the, the system of 
the, the doctrine of qualified immunity um, that has made it virtually impossible for citizens to file lawsuits against uh, law enforcement officers in situations where there's clear evidence of, uh, of wrongdoing. That's another uh, piece of legislation that Senator Booker has, uh, has been proposing that we're gonna take a very careful look at. Um, so, um, in three parts, interrupted by uh, technology, um, we have to listen, uh, we, we have to uh, come together uh, uh, as members of the study. Uh, these proposals settle on a few that we think can make a significant difference and act. Thank you, Tom. Um, a few instructions for um, as we start our live questions. Um, I will call on whoever um, is the next person um, to ask the live question. Um, when we do uh, call on you, please just unmute yourself. Um, if you are having difficulties, I can unmute you from my end. Um, sometimes it's just a little difficult. So um, once we call on you, please just unmute yourself and um, we'll go from there. Our first live question comes from John from Garwood. John, can you hear us? Hi, Ken and Dee. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, John. Excellent. Hello. Uh, you're interrupted by technology. I've been interrupted three times by robocalls, so I'm hoping your uh, legislation starts to take effect pretty soon so we don't, uh, don't have that. Oh, again. But on something a little more serious, uh, uh, you know, despite all of the uh, Russian interference and, and Facebook bots, I was pretty confident in 2016 and 2018 that I'd be able to vote, my vote would be counted, and that uh, I'd know who won by the end of the day or shortly thereafter. And uh, I do realize not all Americans enjoy that, uh, that basic right. Uh, but I'm afraid we're going backwards uh, in between the partisan divide in the nation. And I, I wish I uh, shared some of your uh, optimism you know, regarding uh, how we're coming together. But uh, I, I see us being driven further and further apart. The looming specter of coronavirus and a judiciary that gets more ideological and uh, less judicially focused every day I'm really concerned about uh, the integrity of our 2020 election. Uh, and it's not about voter fraud. So yeah. just picture the chaos on election day and election night under these circumstances. And with all due respect to the US Postal Service, I think putting them into a marquee role in facilitating a national election is not gonna end well. Uh, we'll be turning up ballots in the next millennium and God only knows when they'll be counted. So uh, you know, a kind of a statement and a question or, or a request of, of you, Congressman, I think HR1 has gotten us nowhere. It's a hodgepodge of topics. They're all good, everything I agree with, but trying to address everything from DC statehood to registering 16 year olds is not helping uh, secure the enfranchisement of American voters. Uh, so I encourage you, I think it's already too late for 2020, but I, I, I perhaps there, there's still some time. We need to get back to basics. Uh, surely you can find some support with your Republican colleagues for a viable bipartisan election security bill that helps ensure that all eligible voters have fair and reasonable access to cast their votes in a secure and auditable process and that facilitates the timely and accurate recording and tally of the results. We're nearing the end of the first quarter of the 21st century with over 230 years of experience in running elections and I think we're going backwards. Surely we can do better than this and one party is not going to be able to do it uh, on, on its own. These are fundamental issues that I think uh, should be uh, bringing us all together. So I, I'm, I'm imploring you to help be part of a bipartisan solution in this regard. Thank you so much. Uh, look, uh, I'll, I'll tell it to you straight. I, I, I believe that we could find bipartisan support in the House of Representatives for basic election security legislation. Um, we might even be able to find some agreement with the Senate. Um, the problem there is not Republicans from my point of view, but it's one person in particular, Mitch McConnell, who has made it his life's work to, um, to make uh, uh, our political system more responsive to money than to voters. Uh, and I, I state that very bluntly, it's what I believe uh, to be true. Um, but setting that aside, I think we could find bipartisan support. Um, the problem is I do not believe that at this point, the president would sign a single bill that would make it easier uh, or safer for anybody in this country to vote. 
I think we're, we're past that. He has very, you know, sometimes he's very honest in, in the sense that, that he tells us exactly what he's thinking and why. And, and he has been extremely plain in his statements that if too many people vote in this country, it will be bad. And I don't know how to argue with that. <laughs> um, I mean, I could rationally try to persuade him that that's actually not true, that the partisan impact of lots and lots of people voting is basically nil. Um, but he has convinced himself that that is the case and has um, personally stepped in to uh, prevent uh, any sort of uh, deal making or bipartisan compromise on these issues in Congress. So what are we going to do? What can we do? Uh, what we can get done is to provide resources to states to um, harden their election systems against uh, electronic uh, disruption of any kind, including foreign interference, um, and to prepare their election systems for a, an, a pandemic election, which, you know, I, I take your point about the post office not being perfect, but the reality is that right now we don't have much of an alternative. Um, it's basically in-person voting or voting from home, which means vote by mail. And we have to try to make sure that both are available and both are as secure as possible. And so we are providing money to states, including New Jersey, to make our systems better. Um, I would like to mandate certain things um, so that states, not New Jersey, but states that have not uh, been as, um, uh, as vigilant uh, or interested in, in doing these things are required to do them. And, and again, that is where we run into the McConnell veto uh, because he, he will say that any such, any mandate from the federal government from Congress on the states in this area is quote, federalizing our elections um, and will be rejected out of hand. That's the debate we've had. We've not been able to overcome uh, that argument on his part. So uh, we're gonna keep on legislating. We're gonna keep on putting things forward. I have gotten election security uh, legislation passed in the House of Representatives last year. Um, but I think at this point, the one thing that we, we can uh, be confident we can enact is resources that will allow the states to do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank our you. Next, our next question comes from Andrea from Union. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you, Congressman Lewinowski. How are you? Good to see you. Thank you. Uh, this is a repeat question. I've been on your uh, Zoom chat uh, previously and asked this question regarding unemployment. Have you seen any um, improvement in the claims process? Because I have two family members that are still not able to get their claims. Um, and I've actually helped them by doing the forms and sending them directly to your staff. Um, and the last one was done in May, May 12th, and I still okay. haven't heard anything back. Okay. Um, the answer to your question is I've seen slight improvement, but not enough. Um, we, you know, we had at one point about 1,500 cases, well over 1,000 cases that had come to uh, my office, people in that situation seeking help. Uh, we've cleared out a lot of them. By cleared out, I meant we, we've help the person get uh, their, their check. Um, I think we're down to about a few hundred um, from well over a thousand. Uh, so we have seen in the last two or three weeks um, an acceleration in cases that are resolved. Um, and, you know, so that's semi views, but we're not, as you say, we know we're perfectly aware that there are still people uh, who should have gotten their checks a long time ago who are still waiting. Um, it is the state unemployment system that broke down. Uh, I obviously feel very strongly about this because I'm a member of Congress and we made a promise to the American people um, that this assistance would be available to them, including the addition of the $600 a week uh, bonus uh, payment in effect that Congress um, uh, provided money for. Uh, so my commitment is that we are going to work these person by person, case by case, 
until every single person who is entitled to the assistance receives it. And as you know, I hope you know, the delay does not in any way affect the amount that the person will receive. Each person will receive every penny that they are entitled to going back to the date when they filed their claim. So um, that's one piece of reassurance that, that I can offer. Um, if there are a couple of folks you've already sent our way and they haven't heard, you know, they can, you can always uh, remind our team about those and we'll, we'll, we'll look into them. Um, our, our goal is to try to, you know, we, we can at least provide a human being who can, uh, who can talk to a person and explain, try to explain what, <laughs> what we think is going on and, and try to get them answers, even if we can't always get them their check instantly. All righty. Thank you. Thank you. Our next, uh, just a reminder for everyone on the call, if you do have a question at any point throughout the conversation, please just use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, please include your name, the town you're from, and your question, um, as well as contact information. That'll help us follow up on a lot of the casework issues. Um, our next question comes from Hilda. Hilda, can you hear us? Yes. Go ahead with your question. Hi. Um, thank you very, very much, Congressman, for allowing us to you know, to be able to, to talk to you this way. Um, and uh, what I wanted to ask you is, you know, how can I make a difference besides casting my vote? You know, how can I help you, you know, as a citizen? Um, I know, you know, sometimes we can feel that, oh, you know, cannot do much, but I, I think that we all get together, you know, and, and how can we help you? That, that would be my question. Well, that's, <laughs> thank you for asking. Um, mostly I'm thinking about how I can help you. Um, so it's, it's very nice to hear somebody turn that around. Um, you know, don't, uh, don't diminish the importance of that single vote mm -hmm. and of your influence in getting other people to cast their single vote. Uh, I, I, I honestly believe, I'm an idealist about our democracy, and I honestly believe that if everybody voted, um, that would not result in only people in my party winning or the other party winning, but we would not be having the kinds of problems that we are talking about today. If every young person voted, we would certainly not be having many of the problems that we are experiencing today. And between 2016 and 2018, the number of young people under 30 who voted in a congressional election doubled. That's really good, but it's still much too low. It's still only about 40%. So it's got to double again. And so all of us need to use our influence, particularly with young people, to remind them that we actually have a pretty darn good political system in America. We need to use it. And there are all kinds of forces in our society that are trying to make us cynical, that are trying to make us doubt the usefulness of this democracy of ours, that are trying to convince young people, no matter what you do, nothing is going to change because they want those young people to stay home. They want those people to stay away from the national conversation. So the most important thing I think we can do is just encourage folks, especially younger people in our, in our lives to believe in the country, in our system of government and to take ownership of it. Um, because then, you know, that's, that's how we make progress. Um, you know, beyond that, how can we help? It's a tough time because we're supposed to be staying at home uh, and that's beginning to change. Uh, but um, a lot of, you know, the social activism, a lot of the helping that we try to do uh, in, in our lives is done person to person, and that's been harder um, these days. Um, but there's so many wonderful organizations that are trying to help, that need volunteers, that need money. Um, and, you know, our, our team can certainly direct you to some resources in our community um, that you might be interested in. Um, but yeah, there's a lot you can do. Thank, Thank you. you. 
Thank you both. Um, our next question comes from Trisha. Trisha, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can. Okay. Hi. Thank you, Tom, for taking my call, Congressman. Sure. Sorry. That's okay. Um, I have a developmentally disabled family member that lives here in New Jersey. Um, she lives with a roommate. Um, and while we were all under lockdown, um, the facility put another person of a different gender in their room and they moved him in there in an emergency situation. He was elderly and his two roommates had tested positive for COVID-19. Now the two women that were in the room originally were never even tested. They had been in quarantine. Um, and so when we complained, we were told that that was protocol, that they were following protocol. So my question is, who do I, I, I can't find any information about these protocols. And I'm sure it's not just, you know, this is not a um, assisted living for elderly. This is for developmentally disabled. Right. Um, so I, I don't know if there are different protocols for different types of assisted living, but that was my concern was that, are they following protocol? And if that is a protocol, how do we change it going forward? Okay. Yeah, that sounds weird to me uh, and unwise. And, yeah. and so I'd be surprised if that were true, but I don't know. So um, let us uh, take that offline. Thank you. And um, if you're uh, willing to leave your contact information with us, you can do it in the chat um, uh, or just reach out to our office. Somebody, somebody will talk to you and we'll see if we can answer that, that question or, or find somebody who can answer that question because that seems weird to me. Yeah, and I know I'm probably not, you know, there are extenuating circumstances and I get that, but if we have another wave, I'd like to be able to know what. Yeah, you should know. Right. So yeah. Thanks. Look, the extenuating circumstances that 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 the, the the good people working at these facilities were were presented with an impossible set of challenges oh God, don't and not enough help. Oh yeah. Um, including, you know, the the all important personal protective equipment that we should have enough of in this country, so that every assisted living facility, every hospital, every clinic, every um, uh, facility uh, for um, uh, developmentally disabled kids, uh, every first responder, every firefighter, every EMT, like it's just not an issue. We have enough. And so that's something I'm working on for the next pandemic. Like right now we have to struggle, you know, we're going to this pandemic with the system we have, but the next one we need to do better. So I've got a bill, for example, to fix the national stockpile of uh, medical and protective equipment to make sure that you know, we, we, we keep enough in it so that we're always ready for a major global pandemic. It seems like a simple thing, but like it wasn't, there wasn't enough under the Obama administration or the Trump administration. And so now we're all scrounging. Um, and, you know, and then a lot of the other issues are being debated at the state level right now. Um, was there enough? Uh, oversight of, of these facilities? The answer is almost certainly no, there, there was not. And we're going to have to do better. Well, thank you for taking my question. Of course, thank you. Thank you both. Our next question comes from Mindy from Summit. Mindy, can you hear us? You're still muted, Mindy. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay. Thank you so much. First, thank you so much for your service um, and for taking all of our questions. Uh, my first question is whether you can um, address or comment on the defund the police movement. Um, you know, I'm worried that it's a complicated topic that is um, gaining steam, and you know, there's legitimate um, needs to invest in different parts of our community, but. You know, I'm wondering what your perspective is, what the risks of doing that are, and what you know alternative solutions may be, so we can encourage people to have trust in law enforcement while also 
supporting you know the needs of our communities yeah uh i'm not for it let, let me tell you what i'm for i'm for more accountability and more funding and those two things go together uh, we desperately need um to have uh, effective uh well-led police departments in our country well-funded police departments in our country um we we absolutely should be honoring um, and thanking the police officers, um, the vast majority of whom um, do their jobs because they want to serve the community and protect us. Um, we, we should have um, pay and uh, incentives um, that attract um, really good people um, to want to be police officers as a career. And at the same time, we need to have transparency and accountability. We need to hold uh, everybody uh, who serves the people um, uh, to a very, very high standard. Um, and those two things are totally complementary. In fact, you can't do one, you, you know, makes no sense to do one without, without doing uh, the other. I am, I am a um, passionate believer in the rule of law uh, and justice. And we are, we have far too little respect right now for the rule of law in America, including at some of the highest levels in, in the land. The last thing I want to do is undermine um, the, the, uh, the, the institutions and the agencies, uh, whether it's the FBI in Washington or my local police department um, that, uh, you know, that we depend on uh, to, to do that. But when something happens that is wrong, when, when I see um, police officers uh, violently suppressing demonstrations, beating up uh, a journalist, um, behaving in ways that exacerbate tensions in our society, then you know what? Just as in the military, you, you court-martial people who don't, um, who don't play by the rules, you do the same thing in our police departments. Thank you, Mindy, for your question. Um, our next question comes from Gio from Summit. Gio, can you hear us? Yes, hi. Hey, Gio. Hi, Tom. Thanks for always being available and uh, taking our question. Of course. Um, so I have a question. Um, I've been you know, troubled by, by the police uh, situation in, in Minneapolis and extending uh, other episodes. Um, I thought that, you know, beside, you mentioned oversight from the, the DOG on, on, uh, and accountability, uh, very important, but I would like to, 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 to understand if it's not possible at the federal level to mandate that uh, our 18,000 um, law enforcement agencies take a minimum standard uh, training. Um, so I've been in some larger co corporations where, you know, every quarter or so, you have to take some ethics courses, some certification that prove that you are qualified to do your job. And I've never heard anyone proposing something like this or knowing what the situation is. I've tried to ask in summit, I will try more, although I completely <laughs> trust and, and enjoy the summit police department. Uh, but in general, uh, and, and you know, we cannot pick and choose one city is good, one city is less good. Uh, so I wonder whether we couldn't have, you know, federal uh, mandated training for the police. And on the, la on the last point, this came also when I read an article a few days ago of, as you mentioned, uh, the 82nd, uh, what is it, uh, brigade? Airborne. Airborne, yeah. So it seems there is an ex-colonel from that uh, army branch that is uh, teaching uh, uh, police uh, departments a class or some courses that go under the, uh, his uh, uh, theory and approach, he call it, or someone call it uh, killology. So where he teach people, among other things, how to be forceful and perhaps 
you know, with the aim of killing without having too much uh, moral uh, restraints. So that really worries me that, you know, if in some police department these classes are taught, this goes definitely against what our police should be uh, taught to. Yeah. Um, so the short answer is absolutely yes. I think that's actually uh, one area where we can find bipartisan support that there should be good training, including in responsible methods of, um, of crowd management, how to deal with uh, public demonstrations, um, how to deal with members of the press, um, appropriate uh, use of force, um, how to de-escalate situations um, rather than using tactics that just make uh, people more likely to be violent. Um, I, I've been really struck watching the response around the country. We're seeing kind of a controlled experiment right now because it's the whole country. And you see some police departments doing a really good job and some police departments doing a, 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 a just a blatantly terrible job. Like it's just clear they do not know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, the ones that are doing a good job are the ones where the, the police leadership, they know a demonstration is happening. Um, they meet with the organizers. Um, the, the, their members of their department are not um, behind a line of riot shields. They're right there with um, the marchers. Um, in some cases, we've seen police officers take the knee um, themselves and say, look, we, we agree with you. Like, we don't like bad cops. They give good cops a bad name. Um, but be peaceful. Make sure you don't, you know, uh, you, you don't allow anyone to take advantage of this peaceful demonstration to do something terrible. And in those situations, you, you see the vast majority of demonstrators not only being peaceful, but when they see somebody smashing a window, they grab that person and turn them over to the police because there's trust, right? Everybody's helping everybody do their job. Um, so yeah, we do need we do need that kind of training. We do need national standards. If you look at what what goes on in police academies, only like four, five, six percent of the time that um, uh, that uh, that uh, that you know younger that the cops and training spend is spent on this kind of stuff. It needs to be, I think, a lot more. Um, and that's I think you, you will see legislation. Uh, I hope uh, on that. Okay, thank you. Tom. Thanks. Thank you both. Um, our next question comes from Bob. Bob from New Providence, can you hear us? There you go, Bob. Yeah, thank you. Um, can you update us on the status of the post office? Is it really true that the administration is playing a big game of chicken with its future or? Yeah, I, that's how I would describe it. Because um, I don't think, uh, I, 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 I have a hard time imagining that anyone really wants the post office to just go under. Um, you know, if you, we, we, we obviously need the post office. We need it even more today when people are staying at home and we are much more dependent than ever before on uh, packages being delivered to our homes. Um, as we were discussing before, um, for better or worse, we, we're gonna need, we're gonna be relying on the post office to make sure we can have an election in November. So we need that post office to be strong. Uh, its financial difficulties are mostly the result of a law that Congress passed in the mid 2000s that forces the post office uh, to pre-fund its pension obligations uh, 50 years in advance. Um, that's something we ought to change. The House has tried to, to, to do that. Um, th this, was what, this was something we had pretty much bipartisan agreement on in the Congress and then um, when we were doing the CARES Act and said no. The rumor is that he's, he's angry at um, Jeff Bezos who owns Amazon and Amazon, of course, uses the post office. Um, and apparently he's angry at Jeff Bezos because Bezos also owns the Washington Post, which is very critical of President Trump. So I don't know if that's true, but it's hard to know what is motivating him. Um, 
And maybe it's, as you suggest, a game of chicken where he's holding out and trying to see what we'll give him in exchange for money to help the post office. So we'll, we'll see. Uh, but um, again, I have a hard time imagining that we don't come to some sort of deal on this because, I mean, you know, particularly members of Congress and the Senate from rural states um, who are more likely to be Republican, actually, like they represent constituencies that are even more dependent on the post office. So this shouldn't be partisan, and I hope we will resolve it. Good. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you both. Our next question comes from Melissa. Melissa from Summit. Can you hear us? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Tom. How you doing? I'm good. Um, this is a, a question about your Youth Advisory Council. Um, my freshman uh, from Summit High uh, mm -hmm. was part of the Youth uh, Advisory Council this year. It's about, I guess you had about 200 students or so. Mm -hmm. um, it was really um, amazing. One of the things that my daughter got to do was work on drafting legislation for the various committees that you sit on, whether it's oversight or agriculture or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, for this year's, this coming year's uh, course or committee that my daughter, again, and many others will be a part of, can you work into the curriculum uh, something where they help draft uh, racial inequality legislation or they get to work on uh, issues that are related to race relations because I really think that the future of this movement and any improvement that we make as a society will have to start with the with the youngest people. It needs to yep. grow and if they've already committed to showing up at 8 a.m. to do meetings with you, I think that they're a good start and then it just grows from there. The answer is yes. And the way this works is they get to choose what they work on. Um, at the beginning of the year, we uh, organized them into congressional committees. Okay. And, you know, so there's a foreign affairs committee. Actually, we had two of those. There was so much interest. There's, right. there's a judiciary <laughs> committee and a education and labor and all of these others. And then, you know, each of the committees has maybe 10 kids. And then they decide among themselves, like, what, what is the issue within that committee's jurisdiction that they want to propose legislation on? So we, you know, my job is I give them advice and they come and ask me questions like, would this be a good idea? How about that? But it's totally up to them. So if she wants to do that, uh, and if she's a freshman, I hope she'll participate again next year. She's going to apply again. Yes, yeah. of, of um, course. It's just not a committee. So she, they were kind of put onto committees that you're on, but since it's something That's not true, actually. No, no. Oh. No. I'm only oh. on two committees. I'm on transportation and infrastructure. I'm on foreign affairs. Oh, but we okay. have about 12, I think, at least a dozen. We, we have as many committees as we could for the number of students that we had. Um, I can't, you're not keeping me in the loop, but okay. <laughs> good. Well, <laughs> you know what, wait, maybe I shouldn't be telling you these secrets. <laughs> so okay, if she yeah. wants to, like she should get on, you know, this would be like the judiciary committee or the okay. oversight committee. Maybe if this is her area of interest, that's what she should do. And, um, and, and I would, I would be great, great to hear their advice on those issues. So, yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Good. Thanks. Thank you both. Um, our next question comes from Philip. Philip from Westfield, can you hear us? There we go. Yes, I can. Congressman, good afternoon. Hello. Tom Friedman uh, wrote an article in the uh, New York Times a few days ago asking where the leadership was. I want to thank you for your leadership. And I'm sure everybody on this call, in one way or another, is a leader. My question for you has to do with uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, Snapchat, all those other people, uh, some of whom seem to like to let uh, anyone who's a liar or wants to throw gasoline on the fire do it without ramifications. And uh, thank, thank you, Twitter, and thank you, Snapchat, for at least taking a step in uh, controlling that. What, if any, legislation is Congress looking at to uh, put some more controls on, uh, on these people? Uh, well, thank you. This is complicated, but I've been uh, working on it. Uh, 
So, you know, as you may know, uh, well, obviously we all have freedom of speech, but um, the New York Times and Facebook are both private companies and they have a lot of discretion when it comes to what they publish. And so if you write a, an article, an op-ed piece for the New York Times, and it's full of lies and racism and awful stuff, they don't have to publish it, right? They can tell you to go jump in a lake. Um, Facebook was established with a different principle, um, as was Twitter and all the other social media companies. They decided, we're not publishers. We're just platforms. We're just like the community bulletin board that anybody can walk up to and staple a notice to. We're not responsible for what people post on our sites. That's how it began. And at the beginning of the internet, basically, Congress passed a law known as Section 230 of the Telecommunications Decency Act that basically gives them immunity from any uh, legal action, any lawsuit with regard to anything that you or I may post on their sites. So if you say something on Facebook that libels me, I can sue you, but I can't sue Facebook, right? Now, over time, um, these companies have changed a lot. And we now get almost all of our news, not directly from a newspaper like the New York Times, but from what Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat and Instagram are feeding to us. And what they're feeding to us is in fact determined by these companies because they write algorithms, they write software programs that try to figure out what do you want to hear? What do you want to see? What, if we feed it to you, is going to keep you glued to that computer screen for as long as possible? So they are making choices that determine what news, what information we get. And I think they should be held more responsible, particularly for these algorithms that they write that cause this stuff to spread wildly, including misinformation, including lies, including malicious information that could get people hurt. Um, so I'm glad that some of the companies are beginning uh, to behave more responsibly. Interestingly, and this is where it gets really confusing, um, you know, President Trump issued his own executive order uh, recently um, trying to, uh, you know, get more control basically over uh, these social media companies. And he too proposed limiting the Section 230 of the Telecommunications Decency Act. And I was a bit confused by that because, you know, if you were to actually do that, let's say you took that law away entirely. Facebook and Twitter would be even more likely to take down the president's posts. So for example, if he posts something promoting a, um, an unproven medicine and people take that medicine and they get hurt, uh, well, they could now sue Facebook or Twitter for allowing him to publish that on their sites. Um, if he accuses, uh, a journalist of committing murder, which he did, right? That was one of the, 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 the recent um, uh, uh, cases that, that was very controversial. Well, you know, that journalist um, could not only have a cause of action against the president, but actually Twitter or, or Facebook. So they'd be much less likely to allow stuff that could get them sued. And so I almost wanted to say, well, Mr. President, you, you know, you and I have different goals here, but um, hey, you know, <laughs> let's maybe think about that. <laughs> and you just be careful what you wish for, because I think you're going to get the opposite of what you're looking for. So um, complicated, very interesting, very necessary. And I, I am looking, I, I've been working on legislation. It's just, it, it, it's, it has to be right because, you know, the balance between freedom of speech and responsibility. Thank you, Tom. Thanks. Um, our next question comes from Josh from Mountainside. Josh, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? 
Yes. Hi, Josh. Hi. Uh, thank you, Congressman, uh, for taking the hour and taking our time and questions. I had a question regarding uh, the CARES Act and the extra $600 per week that mm -hmm. is given out uh, to people who have been furloughed or lost their jobs due to the coronavirus. I was wondering what if future rounds are, are in the works with the continuing of coronavirus, what stipulations are going to be put into effect um, specifically for, you know, someone who uh, doesn't have a job and isn't actively looking for anecdotal uh, examples, you know, I know people who are collecting this $600 a week and not actively looking for a job and are comfortable with this extra $600 a week on top of what they would be getting from unemployment, which equals out to more than they were getting with their full-time job. Um, I was wondering where did that um, come in as well to arbitrarily pay someone $600 extra a week instead of matching uh, their paycheck, um, yeah. what stipulations are going to be coming into effect for future rounds and where down the line are the people who are getting this benefit, uh, going to, uh, repay, uh, this, I mean, with our, with our debt at $24 trillion, it seems a little frivolous to just arbitrarily be giving people more money than they would be making working. So that was, that right. was my questions. Yep. Uh, it's a totally fair question. So here, here's the deal. Um, when we did this in the CARES Act, um, I was very much in favor of it because at that moment, we didn't want people to be, you know, most people to be working. Um, we, we, this is a very unique economic crisis in that we chose deliberately to shut down big parts of the economy. We wanted people to stay home. And so I don't think that, you know, and, and we wanted them to be able to do that and, and still be, um, be able to survive economically. And we wanted to be generous to people who we were ordering in effect to stay home, right? Through no fault of their own. Um, so I think for a couple of months, the height of the crisis, March, April, May, I think that was the appropriate thing to do. And I don't think that um, there was much harm done. Um, in fact, I think we did a lot of good. Um, personal income in this country actually did not take a hit in April um, as a result of the CARES Act, almost entirely. Um, that said, um, I actually agree with you that going forward, uh, it would not be the best idea to, to just, you know, for months extend this additional $600 uh, in unemployment compensation. Um, that was in the HEROES Act that we passed in the House. Um, I agreed with most of the HEROES Act, but I said at the time that I was not in favor of doing that because now we're moving into a phase where we want to gradually, you know, responsibly make it possible for people to go back uh, to work. Um, I also supported a separate piece of legislation which has not passed the House. Uh, it's bipartisan in the Senate um, that would replace a lot of what we did in the CARES Act with something similar to what a lot of European countries did, which is a, a a program where through the IRS, through our tax authority, um, we, we are actually um, providing direct assistance to businesses to keep their employees on the payroll if that business can show that it is taking an economic hit because of the coronavirus crisis. That could replace the PPP loan program where it's just a direct payment from IRS to the small business rather than going through banks and, and loans and, and all the complexities um, there. Um, bottom line, I, I want to be, if we're going to be spending this much money, and you're absolutely right, it's a huge amount of money at a time when we already have a huge amount of debt. If we're going to be spending this much money. I would rather spend it to keep people working and connected to their employer than to pay people to be unemployed. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, thank you everyone on the call for your patience and staying with us. I know we're a little bit over. Um, so just uh, to respect everyone's time, I will go ahead and turn it back over to the Congressman for closing remarks. Um, well, thank, thank you. And, and um, let me just say that uh, nothing on this call uh, 
uh, in any way diminished the confidence that I expressed at the beginning that on the big questions, we are pretty united. Uh, I think Americans are, are caring, we're compassionate, we're pragmatic. We want to solve problems. We want leaders who take responsibility rather than passing blame onto others. Uh, we want uh, a government that, 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 that tries to bring us together uh, and that calms things down in moments of tension rather than trying to make uh, everybody more anxious. Um, that's what I'm going to keep on trying to do. Uh, it helps me um, more than I can say to, to hear from constituents because your priorities then become my priorities. Uh, and, you know, I'll keep on doing this. Uh, we'll do it online as long as we have to and in person as soon as we can so that I can report back to you what I'm, what I'm doing, what I'm thinking, and, um, and we'll, you know, keep that conversation going. So thank you again, everybody. Please uh, stay safe and, and, uh, and you know how to stay in touch uh, with me and with my team. So I look forward to hearing more from you.